I'm an, I'm uh, yeah, high standard whore. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's a great way to start. I, 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 I just started recording and uh, so. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, it was gonna end up. I'm a whore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great opener. So Very Sal, good. Sal, thank you for uh, for joining us today. It was a uh, it was a bit of a process trying to figure that out, but you did it. I'm proud of you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. I'm a 62 year old man, sure. My birthday was a week ago, actually. Well, happy, uh, happy belated birthday. What did you What did you do for your birthday? I went to work. Mm. I went to work, and so, I came home and I slept. I thought the uh, I thought the the sandwich shop closed down. You know what? A business is uh, is, is, is an addiction. Mm -hmm. It's real addiction. You cannot just pull yourself, like unless you have a, a sick kid in a hospital on life support. You don't want to pull it to die because you, you love it, mm -hmm. but you want to rest too. So it's very confusing situation when you have your own business. It's very confusing. It's an addiction. So just, uh, I cannot pull it out of my system, but I know for a fact, I mean, it's going to happen like soon, like really, really soon. It's going to happen. But uh, I can do it. Now, you know, when we did the closing a month ago, People waited three and a half hours to say goodbye to me. It's like, I mean, we had, you know, they have, we, we had the people out of, all the way around the church to 190th. I couldn't believe it. Like, it's like they, they went to, like, two, around the block. Yeah. Actually, we had a guy came in and he played bagpipe to entertain the people. No way. I'm that serious. I have some video on Facebook. You can see it. That guy just showed up. Brother said about parking lot and he just, hell. A pipe, backpipe was music, beautifully walk around entertaining people. As some people come from Vancouver, like my friend uh, Jennifer O'Connell, and uh, she came to Vancouver for distancing and the city <laughs> and I had to make sandwiches. Not easy, but one point, I had almost twelve to sixteen volunteer. I well, I saw the video, but yeah, Sal, do you do you think that? Uh... Is it okay if I call you Sal? Do you like Mr. Cahill or? Try it. Call me Sal. Okay. You so, okay, you got it. So Sal, call me do you think that people were coming for the sandwiches, or do you think they're coming to say goodbye to you? Oh, uh, this was very emotional, very mm -hmm. emotional day for me. I cried a few times because uh, there's there's a plant over there called Bo like a Chinese plant, Bosnai, whatever it's called. People brought me. I had enough cards from a people, flower, a plant, cactus, food homemade for me. It was very emotional. So, but no, we couldn't have enough bread for everybody. Like we made a thousand sandwiches in one day, five hours. <laughs> so good. We, couldn't, we couldn't really, uh, then people signed a petition to open one more weekend. So we opened another one weekend. <laughs> Then people kept say, say, oh, come on. Then I felt going two days a week, it's not gonna really kill me, right? It's not gonna kill me. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's crazy to talk about business. It's crazy. If you love the people, you're a blessed man. And if you hate the people, you're, you're, you're like God curse. So it's, uh, if, you, if you really love people, you're attached to them. It's like, totally different feeling when you see them, right? They can feel it too, that you like them and you're not pretending, right? Well, I, in my, uh, so I lived in the area and I think I've been to your, your shop three times, but every time I left and like, maybe I went in there and I was feeling a little down or what have you. And then your personality, your care for people, I'd always leave happy. Even the one time you kicked the guy out because he was on a cell phone. Oh, yeah. Good. But you gave him, you gave him lots of warning shots. You're like, sir. Sure. Anyways, but sure. every time that I've, I've seen you, it's like, yes, the sandwiches yeah. are great, but really I come to see you. <laughs> oh my God. It's uh, it's, you almost have to read everybody's mind when they come to Delhi. Right. You really have to read their minds when they come in. If you're having a good day, make the day better. If they have a bad day, fix their day. Make it a, a better day. So, but some people determined to be miserable. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna let one customer a week or two customers or three customers a week, sometimes more like 
we kick out two, three people a day. Once they kick us like eight in a row, just beside the point. It's like, why would you not let one guy miserable to ruin your day and the people's day? You kick him out, people talk about it, more customer comes in. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's crazy how you could make, you know, you could make a hundred people that, well, over a thousand uh, last weekend or the, or the, when you're doing the closing, but Perfect. this one, this one person, you know. No, no, no. I have volunteers behind yeah. the counter. Oh, no, people no, can I, make I know, I know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because, because uh, volunteers came the day before, slicing tomato, watching lettuce, slicing cheese. Then the next day, they were there before me. When I got to the shop at 8.30, 8.15, a volunteer is already there. Right. It's because they want to help. Then the following weekend, I had the same volunteers coming in. Like, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think, I think personally, I hope people shouldn't think this way either. People think they owe me something, but they, nobody owe me anything. It's my choice. And nobody owes me anything, but people think they owe me something. But no, I really, I don't believe it. they owe me anything. I really, I really don't believe it. Do you think maybe you're motivating them though to, you're inspiring them to help? Uh, uh, I, I can talk about two brothers of mine came to Canada and they went back to Lebanon, right? And the reason yeah. for this, uh, they, thought, they thought people are indifferent to other people's problem and misery. And so they, they said this totally different culture. We're not gonna stay in, they left. Compared to me, I say I can take a challenge. I can, like, uh, I don't know, it's like, uh, see how I can uh, toggle things around, right? And I succeeded, but without any efforts, I have to admit it. I don't do any efforts, I just do it. And uh, yes, I care for my customer and I want, uh, I want them to be happy with once I leave my store. But service is way overrated in this country. When you walk out of my store, you walk out with a sandwich product, not the freaky service. Like, you know what I mean? Right, I want right. to see some, huh? <laughs> I see you, you know what saying, mean? Yeah. People go to the restaurant and they said, oh, uh, service was really good, but food no good, not gonna go back. Now, look at me. Service is a shit, but this guy knows how to make a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're familiar with the term politically correct, yes? Yeah. yeah, well, that's, you're definitely not politically correct and that's uh, what people love about you. You know what? It will never be either. Because I think, okay, like, let's say it worked with racism. Mm. Racist. It's so abused beyond your imagination. A Fijian guy came to my store, he's like 6'4, hand across his chest, and he said to me, Oh, the white people don't like to work. There's all a bunch of white people there, but none of them said a word. Mm. And I lost it. When you came to this country, did you have a freeway for your bridges, hospital, police, just a system? Oh, fuck, man. Look at the hell out of you right now. <laughs> hey, fuck. Look at me say, but I want to send this. You have no fucking shit. Get the hell out of here right now. And, the, and then, then the Caucasian guys, one of them said, thank you for defending us. So what do you mean defending us? You have no mouth? Or was it called us racist? Why not me? You have an accent. You see what I mean? Even a white guy was racist against me. He said, because I have an accident, I can get away with it. <laughs> what? So. What? What? We're all. We're that? all... <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely something that we're all very sensitive about these days. Is, is this... Why, though? I, okay, the word nigger. The word nigger, a negro. Or oh, the N word. But actually, it's a part of the history. How can you erase a part of a human history? It's stupid. I mean, that was a pretty hor like that's a horrible word and a, a horrible time. Why? People call me pack. People call me right. terrorist during September 11th. I was treated like shit. But I knew it was like temporary. I mean, I put up with people uh, calling me name because uh, I'll tell you a story. I was September 11th when it happened. Mm -hmm. I was upset. I was walking downtown Vancouver. At that time, I lived at, uh, at 1041 Kongs, I guess. No, I lived here in Chinatown. I don't remember. So one guy, I was walking side by side with him. He said to him, he said to me, he said to me, uh, what's your name? He was cruising me though, but he wasn't pretty face. So I'm not going to do him. Then I said to him, I'm Salam. He said to me, he said to me, oh, you're the Arab terrorist flyer prince. And he was telling, telling me, mm -hmm. and I, and then I said to him, oh, you're right. You're right. I said, have you ever slept with an Arabic man? He said, no. You want to try it? 
Yeah. So we went to Hotel Vancouver, Vancouver on uh, Georgia. Room yeah. 905. That's a good for. room. You've never been there. No, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't been there. Not that room, 905. Have you? No. Because it's still a smell. Oh. So <laughs> I remember it. It'd be imprinted. Yeah, you're right. But so, we went to that room, and he said to me, uh, uh, hey, are you going to do me? I said, I have to be high first. I need some coke. He said to me, okay. He said, but go buy it. I don't have money. He said to me, uh, that now he's insulting me to the maximum. Why don't you give me a couple hundred dollars, go and buy it, and come back? So he gave it to me, that idiot, never went back. <laughs> he's going to home. The poor, poor guy paid for the hotel and for the coke that I never bought. <laughs> <laughs> and that day, September 11, you yeah. know the C Fox radio station? C Fox, yeah. Larry and Uli? Yes. Uh, I used them on their show all the time. Then they had a, a, a contest called Ever Tougher Contest. They said, then my job, uh, and soap up salon. Soak me up. So a lady from Cloverdale uh, has to enter the contest and she has to use a soap all over my beautiful hairy body. By the way, the secret nipple. That's a beautiful nipple. That's a beautiful so, nipple. So, so she's, uh, she got naked, I got naked. They call me the champion. But I'm a male escort. I'm used to get naked. It doesn't take much out to get fucking naked. Right. Right. I'm a male escort. For God's sake, I'm a whore. So they, uh, then, but she was so smooth. She shaved everywhere. Yeah. No way to melt that freaky soap on her. <laughs> I'm so hairy. A soap melted in half a time. I ate half a soap, by the way. Just finished to get over with this fucking contest. The same day, September 11th. Happened on September 11th. Oh, yeah. Very active so day for me. <laughs> well, I was gonna say you 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 propositioned yourself as a male prostitute. You took a guy's money because you said you're gonna buy him cocaine. Yeah. Um, do you do you I drink or do early morning? I was six thirty in the morning. So I had to pick me up from home. Yeah. Take me to Overdale. Get naked with the lady. She was shaved. She was smooth. Yeah. Oh, she was smooth. Well, Cloverdale, that's where I'm from. So yeah. not leveled like my testicles, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> You didn't hear this one, did you? What well, as you, you get Yeah, as you as you get older, you don't worry too much about your uh your 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 body image, I guess, eh? You have you have no you have no shame, right? You're just you believe in the true expression of uh, of masculinity. Yeah, listen, lots of people love daddy. Keep it in mind. Lots of like ladies, I like some actually at a happy days in motel in Westminster. It was a shithole, drug hole. Oh, it was a bad place to be in. Mm -hmm. And a lady, she was like 16, I was like 28, 29. She took me to the hotel and she used to put the chocolate up my butt and eat the chocolate out of my butt. And one day she lay down on her bed and she said, Daddy, she's now double my age, triple my age. Oh, Daddy, sit on my face. I did. Oh, Daddy, give me some chocolate. I did. And she said, give me more. I pushed it hard. Whole log came out at the same time. I lost a customer. She never called me back. That's sad, isn't it? Well, I know how important customer service is to you, Sal. So that was very tough. No, no customer service. Don't insult me. Thank you. No customer service. No. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I so see them well. For good customer service, you go to Subway. For good sandwiches, you come to see me. That's how it works. Right. Well, I, yes. But I will say the sandwiches, while they are delicious, I, I have certainly come to see you because of your personality, and you're just you you cheer people up. So, hey, listen, uh, I, uh, uh, oh my God, as I said earlier, I love a human race in general. Yes. Yeah. I love a human, I love people, and I don't believe uh, we should label anybody as bad a person. Let's say you're good to your mama and papa and girlfriend and boyfriend and aunt and cousin, but you're bad to me. How can I label you as a bad person? You can't. It's, it's, here in North America, Western world, 
if you pay your bills every time on time, like every time on time, you miss one payment, you're punished. Mm. It's so sad mentality. It's so sad. They don't understand we're human. Like, uh, so what if you made one mistake? So what if you miss one payment one month because you, you have to, whatever you have to do? Why should your interest rates go up by 5%, whatever it is? Because when, but all your life, you pay your, uh, your uh, credit card and your debt on time and things like that. You know what I mean? So you're it's saying, are you, are you saying that we're too hard on, on each other? Is that what you're saying? Oh, so? hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Everyone labels people gay, straight, bisexual, trisexual, asexual, metrosexual. Uh, it's fucked up. Sexuality and sex is determined by you, not by other people around you. Not by the labels. Absolutely. Yeah. Since I came to Canada, I hear the same stories. I came to Canada about a gay right, right? Mm -hmm. And a woman right, right? Four years later, still the same issues coming out. Don't you think by now, as a good human being, we should be able to find a solution for it and get over it? Well, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, what is the solution? Right? Like you say, it's the same issues. If you look at the woman as a person, not the woman, the solutions are there already. That's my opinion. Well, you just, you, I think you're even kind of talking about the answer there is you just treat others equally, right? Absolutely. With all honesty, when people come to my store, I don't look at this male and female. Then I'm joking with the woman the same way I joke with the man. Right. Some men say, oh, woman here. I mean, don't they like a woman to talk dirty? I mean, they touch each other more than boys touch each other. You know, it's like, so what if she's a woman? She's a woman, so I cannot talk, be myself, because she's a woman? It's like, it's, uh, but of course, I don't pay attention. I, mean, I don't really care. And, but I, I feel, even sex and sexuality, if a man thinks he's a woman, so he's a woman in his own mind, so we have to accept he's a woman. And if a man, if a woman is a man, Showing her she's a man, trapped in a woman's body, so she's a man. It's like, why don't you just come up with a formula like this, get it over with, and start still fighting it? And oh, I don't understand that. It's like, even, even like a, abortion. I mean, I, I'm anti abortion, but I'm not gonna force a woman uh, to follow my instruction because it's her body, I leave it to her conscience. I, I don't anti abortion, use condom, use pills, whatever it is, but I'm not gonna tell a woman what to do, what not to do. Because not my right. I'm a man. I don't know what it feels to be a woman to start. I have nine and a half inches. I can't really ignore it. Right. Well, so what you're saying is that we think too much. I don't know about thinking too much. A drama too much. Too much mm. drama. Mm. Too yeah. much dramas. I so, swear, between you and me. I love my customer, my friend. With all honesty, four of my customers were calling me in the middle of the night telling me how bad they're feeling depressed and things like this. Actually, practically, I was talking to two people at the same time. Put on hold, put on hold. No joke. One of them as early as 4.30 in the morning. How, do you ever get this, tired being this, this giver that you are? No. The best source of energy is clean conscience and good sleep, but not last night. <laughs> Don't good sleep at all. But normally, clean conscience can give you more energy than anything else. Hmm. So by helping others and giving to others that... Other than don't lie, don't be close of case, be yourself. If people get offended, you don't have to see them every minute. What's a right. big deal? Why are people so easily offended? If, why people so what? Why are people so easily offended? Because life is too easy here. Mm. Those people never been put into a test. It's a... Uh, it's like easy in life in North America, like very easy. Nobody can starve unless their beer and wheat comes before their meal. You know what I mean? Right. Their car comes before their home. Then they cannot pay your rent. Then they call sell. Can I borrow hundred dollar? Never get it back, by the way, most of the time. Very yeah. few give me back. Okay? So but I cannot say no to them. It's a situation. You can your money. So. But I I believe strongly. It, I think uh, people are too spoiled. Like they're never really, I come from a world torn country, right? So it's like, uh, I kind of, uh, uh, we, uh, 
we go through hell, bomb over your head, missile over your head. You have to walk a kilometer to go to a small town where it's safer. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it is totally different. So you can, over there, like here, I, like I remember in Lebanon, we, uh, we, uh, we had to save every drop of water of any sewers for summer. It doesn't rain for four or five months. Right. So you need water to water the fields. Actually, they stop before, I mean, I mean, North America and Europe talk about environment, environment. It's already happening over there 50, 100 years, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Those people were saving sewers water to, to water their uh, orchard and their lands. Wow. So the, you... And actually, you're... the government give up time, two hours only. So we all get our tools and go to our field and we want water to run faster. So we, 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 we practically clean in front of the water to make water go fast, get more water than in two hours than if we don't do what we're supposed to do, but we did. So you're saying that your upbringing in Lebanon and then, you know, being there during this war period, this time of strife, that's kind of made you grateful. And then you come here and you see that we live such uh, overcomplicated lives. So you're saying that we just yeah. don't have perspective? Is is that well, a, a lot of people don't have perspective? I think a lot of people uh, help us there for them, right? Like uh, help for uh, uh, help us there for them. Like life in North America is not difficult, and Canada is not difficult, as I said earlier. Yeah, it's, anybody can survive, right? But. I don't know. I, don't, like, like, uh, I think the major problem, really, but I'm not really expert in it. Family lifestyle. Okay. Divorce. Right. People have an excuse like we grow apart. You don't grow apart. You have kids. One years old, two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old. For your own selfishness, woman or man, you practically victimize your babies and kids. It's sad. You bring people to this world, but oh, we grow apart. And some divorce process can take up to three years of stress. Right. And, and the woman takes kids as the bargaining things, and the man takes kids as the bargaining things. It's like, it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. I mean, don't you think people should be taught at school? Okay, guys, you're going to find a partner, you're going to make kids, it's your responsibility to look after your kids. Well, I think a lot of us don't know, like you say, how to manage relationships, right? That's, we're not taught that in school. We're taught, you know, math and reading. We're not necessarily taught the, the social skills, at least not as much when I was a kid. People always teach their kids in this country, uh, don't trust anybody but yourself. Don't look after yourself first, then look after others. That is a perfect society what it is. I look after you, you look after your girlfriend, girlfriend look after her friend, a friend look after her friend, a friend look after the neighbors. We have the perfect society. Right. When we look after each other. Yeah. But, but that's if, what you If your mama said to you when you were born, mm -hmm. don't trust anybody but yourself, right? Or it said to you, you come first, look after yourself first. So, so you learn to be selfish from the day one you were born. You mm. learn to be fearful of people around you since the day one you were born. Okay, a lady, somebody stole her purse. Headline news. A Lebanon, you have to have like 10, 15 bomb before making headline news. Right. Like, like, ladies, be careful on the street. Somebody snapped a purse from an elderly lady. So what? It's just like, it's like, it's so simple. As a problem, it's so simple. So what, the old lady? Uh, lost her purse, or old young lady lost her purse. The same thing, um, uh, dress code, right? I mean, I believe that uh, most women like to be lovely and compete with each other. So about time, men too, you start wearing some makeup, I think. Like, uh, like I shaved my butt last week and I shaved the front too this morning. But this is beside the point. But uh, they dress up the most beautiful way, the sexiest way. In the elevator, I was looking at the lady and she said to me, what are you looking at? You. Why? Look away, I'm not gonna look nowhere else but at your breast. And once I was at the Holy Rosary Church, 
I do like meditation. I'm not a religious man. So I just sit down watching people praying. Right. It brings some peace, right? Because they're doing what, they're doing what they believe in, right? And the, the ladies were sitting down on her knees in her breast, in her nipples almost coming out. Oh, got me horny right in the church. So I, I, and I look, look, look at her breast. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I can keep it in my pants. Oh my God. But what happened, she looked at me. She, you know what she thought? I was going to steal her purse. She moved her purse from her left side to the right <laughs> side. Said, oh, I'm looking at your brass. Who gives the fuck about your purse? <laughs> I think it's a very really funny story at the church. Well, we definitely do, like, it sounds like what you're saying to me is that we don't really see what's important, and what's important is right in front of our faces. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. But listen, there's major, I very, you know, Persian Spark, when I first came to BC in 1985, right. and we have like 20 or to 30 homeless people in Persian Spark right there. Right. Where I live. Like Pigeon, Pigeon I live. Park. Persian Spark, yeah. Pigeon, Pigeon yeah. Park. Yeah. One block from where I live. So at that time, we used to make like uh, 50 sandwiches. Yeah. And, but you never saw anybody giving food on the street. Now, picture this. This baby here, the Venice guy, started giving food on the street. Now, everybody, because he made it to the media. So everybody wanted free publicity, that's including one sandwich chain, uh, when they count how many homes they give free sandwiches on the street, because they want to be in the media, right? You see it? Mm. So now we can see more and more people giving food on the street. Right. I, I, way more. Like, I, I know this too, right? So, I, I think uh, I may affect people opinion. Yeah? People actually on Facebook, if you go see all compliments I get, it's beyond. I mean, I'm glad I'm not flying like an eagle by now. I'm still my feet on the ground. <laughs> right. It, 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 it can go through lots of people's heads. People say, how nice you are, how nice you are. I can tell people, please help me to keep my feet on the ground. I don't want to fly. Well, how do you stay humble? Yeah. How do you uh, stay humble? Easy. Yeah. Well, we all, if we, we all have a purpose in life. And if you don't have a purpose, make yourself a purpose. What's your purpose? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, my smile, I guess, make people happy. It's like, uh, I don't know, look up to poor people. I mean, uh, honestly, I give more money to poor than I give for myself. Is that stupid? <laughs> I have an ugly Chevy car. <laughs> I have an ugly phone that I keep it together with a rubber band. Like <laughs> probably that's why it didn't connect. <laughs> well, I, money doesn't seem like you know money is not a measurement of, of I'm success. I'm not fearful of future. I'm not. I don't fear the future. Yeah. Kisera sera. What? What's that? Kisera sera. What is that? Your song. Kisera sera. What will be? What, no, you never heard it. No. Well, you need deserve a good spank. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's very promising. Isn't it? <laughs> this is why we're doing the Zoom interview, Sal, so I don't get hit by yeah. you. <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh my God! You're, for your own protection, right? Exactly. Protection. Yes. Yes. It's like fuck yeah. <laughs> so, uh, my purpose of life. I don't know. Hmm. Just making people happy, I guess. Uh, be happy myself. If uh, I'm not saying I'm a good person, but if I don't feed one homeless every day on my way to work, I'm not a happy man. So where are you? Where are you working now? I work Saturday, Sunday at the deli still. Really? I still work to this week. I still work to this week. I still do it. Because, because yeah, when, well, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I love it too. I, I have to bring my wife there still because she's like, oh, I've heard What's about him. What's his name? Uh, Carl is his name. Is his Wonderful name, Carl? guy. Wonderful guy. <laughs> Listen, it's funny about the gay marriage, okay? Mm. Uh, uh, one of them has a wife, one of them has a husband. I can fucking understand it. Although I'm for equality, equality and, and uh, you know, but this is my husband. Oh, uh, like, it's like a late, like guy asking, kind of, this is my husband. Oh, please. I mean, I'm not against it. Don't get me wrong. But kind of shocking for me. 
it's like oh my god it's like now uh, i have a danish couple he's come to my delhi the husband is so feminine and the wife is so masculine yes go figure go figure that can happen yeah yeah it's like it's like i'm talking about two guys oh so i see what you're saying yes yeah yeah they have these gendered roles but they're two the, the, the gay couple that has like two guys the feminine feminine one who does crochet mm-hmm. is the husband and the other one is i shouldn't be laughing i have to admit it otherwise people think i disrespect them no i don't uh uh a bit confusing for me a bit too confusing for me why do you think like 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 it, it it just seems that we're so wrapped up in you know gender and and sexuality like you're talking why about. because i see it every day in my store almost right yeah and it gets me a bit confused <laughs> have you ever heard of toxic huh have you ever heard of toxic masculinity uh no what's toxic masculinity don't explain to me please it's very new for me So toxic masculinity is this idea of you know you're you're I'm a man and and men don't cry and we like to drink beer and it's, oh, yeah. it's this That's idea of yeah. some of my customer uh, are called, called masculine toxic, mas- toxic toxic masculinity yeah oh. and they gave me a blow job they gave me a blow job actually they did <laughs> some of my customer and that's not a joke at the deli in the back room they did Yeah. So they, they said they're very masculine, and I'm straight, man. Oh, yeah, I suck my dick, Dan. Suck it. <laughs> so, many times. <laughs> they came back for more. <laughs> do, does your family, do, are they still in Vancouver? Or do they still? There's only one in Canada. My family ran away. Back to Lebanon. They just because they couldn't handle it here, or what do you think? No, uh, two brothers only came to Canada and they went back. Mm-hmm. They went back because they thought, as I said to you, uh, okay, my brother Karim, he's not religious, but he thinks every white man is gay. He was bad. He was bad. He was bad. My brother Azim, he was like, he's not fanatic Muslim, but he was some kind of uh, religious man, right? Right. So my brother uh, Azim. He couldn't handle seeing all the lady on the street, all that bra and you know mini skirt and things like this. So he went back to Lebanon too. Huh. I'm the only one stayed here. You're the only one. Because I loved you guys. Actually, a reason for most of you accepted me the way I am. My mom and dad, a uh, bit above average, right? Lebanon. So, if uh, if my father joked a little bit more than normal, when they came home, my mother would be fighting with him. Oh my God, that you want lower caste? It's like I, I believe that fight when I was a child. It's like I believe, the, like I saw this fight between both of them, day in day out. It, it, it hurt me. Because my father came from poor family, he had a bakery. Now in old days, eleven like hundred years ago, let's say or nine years ago, or eight years ago, my father is ninety-four years old, by the way, and he's, he had like fourteen inches dick. No fucking joke. You have mushroom head. My father has big peach with mouth wide open. Oh, I can't believe it when I saw it. I almost want to kill him, bring it with me to Canada, do penis transplant. I couldn't have the nerve to do that. I couldn't do it. Oh my god! I can't believe his size. So your dad's ninety four. Yeah, he's still alive. Your dad? He's ninety four. Holy smokes! And he smoked like cigarettes, like a chimney. But he doesn't he, smoke Canadian cigarettes. He smokes. He goes to the farm, and cut the leaf, shred it himself. No chemical, nothing. So he's still ninety four years old. Smoke like a chimney, nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. Is that shocking? That's uh yeah you can't get away with that here. That's died sure. two years ago. My mother died two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear. And um, she had, she had Alzheimer for 16 years. 16. Years. Average Alzheimer in Canada is eight years. Do you know why? They sent to rest home because they feed them chicken broth and one piece of carrot. Right. Now, for God's sake, let's face it. Okay. 
If somebody's fucking dying a month from now, feed them people on steak. What do you want to care about their house? <laughs> fucking dead. That break my heart. Yeah. You go to any rest home and you see the elderly people actually turn their hand. They want to see like, uh, they want to touch you and talk to you. Mm. That's a heartbreaking. It is a heartbreaking. Maximum for people Alzheimer in Canada, they live like eight years, 10 years, maximum. My mother, she died at the age of 92. She has a breast, a huge breast, because she breastfed 10 kids, right? right? So she had a huge breast. My God, my father was a lucky man too. So this is beside the point. My, my family, for my mother Alzheimer's, I have a maid brought from Bangladesh to Lebanon for three years to look after my mother. Medication on time, food on time, water on time, a meal. Nobody sat down and eat until their mother sat down too. She's Alzheimer. It's totally different culture. Right. It, it, it sounds like you take care of each other, right? At least your family in, took care of each other. In Canada, more and more now. In Canada, more and more people take care of each other. And mm. uh, I think COVID is helping to, uh, to get people closer to each other. What are, what are your thoughts on COVID? You know what? Follow the expert. Right. Because... If they're right, we saved lives. Mm -hmm. Lives, right? If they're wrong, we screwed. So we can sue them later on. But why don't you follow the expert advice? I mean, there's a system in place. We have to follow the system. Right. At least in a crisis like now, COVID. Some people say it's conspiracy. I don't know. I'm not an expert. Some people said it's like, oh, this is the guy of uh, Microsoft. He has pattern. I, I don't know what the people who, okay, with all respect to every job, dishwasher in a restaurant can talk about Bill, what's his name, the guy? Bill what? Gates. Bill Gates, yeah. He can get on his mind, and Bill Gates decided to reduce population of this earth. My ass. I don't know what people come up with something like this. But it seems that it sells. Well, that's just it, right? It sells. We Anything sells. Like a, Anything on the, like one seventy two versions for the Muslim, right? If you bomb yourself, you got seventy two versions and happen. Oh my God! I mean, that, I never heard of it, and I'm a Muslim. And I was sent to a Quranic school to study Quran when I was a child. Mm -hmm. During Ramadan, I had to read the book three, four, five times in one month. Almost six hours of reading the book. Right. I mean, then uh, hadith means what the Prophet Muhammad said. Sunnah it means the rules. I was taught all this from age of two, until age like eight. Because my parents and you, no hope for me. <laughs> were, you, were you a very re rebellious young person? You just didn't follow the rules? Okay, I was sexually abused by my oldest brother since the day when I was born, as long as I remember. And my oldest brother, and my mother knew it, but she seems like she encouraged it. Uh, because he was a very intimidating man. And my father didn't protect me. So around the age of 14, I ran away. I didn't see them until almost 30, 31 or something like this. Like oh, 27 years later, I went to see them for the first time. Then they kicked me out. My mother was talking about dispute between two brothers. I don't take sides. I don't take sides. You can tell me something. Carol Thomas, other your wife, I said, I can listen to both of you, but I'm not going to judge either one of you. And I'm not going to take side each one. Because we all, when we tell some stories, we tend to, or something happened to us, exaggerate to gain the support of other parties, right? Like, it seems like we're, we're, we're seeking their approval of what we did, right? There's another, uh, I think, a major issue, a way of thinking, right? Hey, what was my point anyway? I lost it. Well, you're talking about how you moved away from home when you're 14. So, so my father protected my father. Then they, to punish me for sexually abused by my oldest brother, they sent me to live with my, my aunt, and I was brought up by my aunt. Hmm. But in my own mind, I knew it. I'm going to run away. It's going to happen. And somehow at age of 14, 15, gone. 
my, when I was living in Beirut and the civil war started, my father came to, the, to pick me up and I turned my gun on him. I said, I'm not gonna go home to the same hell ever again. Mm -hmm. I never lived at home. I lived with my aunt all my life. And uh, what's the difference gonna make to me if I live with my aunt or I live here? So this is dark side of my life, I have to admit. Mm -hmm. I never had a childhood, never had a childhood, right? Because when you're sexually abused, you are live in constant shame and fear. Shame of doing something not socially acceptable and the fear of people's gonna know about it. Right. You know what I mean? So that, that was the dark side of my life. But I'll tell you this, when I ran away, oh my God, I bet you I felt almost like my feet didn't touch the ground. That's how good I felt. Because you got out of this this home where you didn't feel safe, obviously. Yeah. So how did you how did you come to to Canada? Like, oh, oh. long story. I lived in I went, left Lebanon, then I, I left Tripoli, Lebanon. I went to Beirut, Lebanon. War started between Laila, between a Catholic and Muslim, and I was uh, living in a, a first of all I was living in a Catholic town called Hadith Shwayfat. Hadith Shwayfat was all Catholic. One day they were looking for me to kill me because I was the only Muslim in town. Believe it or not, a Jehovah's Witness saved me. They could come up to my place. They're looking for you. And a Jehovah's Witness in the middle of the night gave me a right to Green Line. And he said to me, you go this direction. Now, if somebody yell at you, Kuf, means stop in Arabic. You stop. Don't run, otherwise he's going to shoot you. Mm. You fall in the Say, okay. He said, I'm going to sit in my car until you cross almost 100, 200 meters from it. Just to make sure that you're safe. I said, okay. Stay. I went to lie like he was a Shia Muslim. But they weren't as bad as a Catholic to me, so I was okay. <laughs> then uh, I was living in that town, and I went to University of uh, Lebanese, means University of Lebanon, or whatever it is, to study genie uh, on uh, chemie, uh, chemical engineering. Right. Oh. So then war was so severe between East and West one night, like so severe. That, uh, that an old building was shaking. And I have a cute roommate, he jumped into my bed, he said to me, oh, can I sleep next to you? And I fucked him that night, I had sex with him. That was the point. So then, um, then next day, bombing was so severe, we walked uh, across the mountain in Lebanon, things like this, until we ended to Syrian border. Then we took, we were like five people took a taxi from Damascus, Syria, to Hamas, Syria, to, to, to border. Then Syria didn't want to keep us, they want to, let us go open a border so we can go back to Lebanon. Oh, it was a mess. So we landed in Cyprus, then from Cyprus, Saudi Arabia, Jeddah, Damam, Riyadh, all the cities. Then, uh, then I, went to, I, I went to Cyprus. I bought a passport for $5. Now in old days, the passport was not like now, high tech. The passport was uh, like you, there's your picture under plastic. You lift it somehow, like steam it a little bit, you put your picture, you get a passport. Mm. Beautiful. I got my passport. So I went to, first stop was Copenhagen, Copenhagen, after Saudi Arabia and things. Yeah. And I went to Denmark and um, at the airport, I speak French, Francais, perfectly, perfect French. So I was going at the Copenhagen airport, there was uh, two gates say, anything to declare, nothing to declare. So I took nothing to declare. What the hell, Danish customer asked me, I don't have him, I didn't speak Danish. So I, uh, I said them in French, swing at them. Fui me welcome, means fuck off. Pas yeah. faire for real, fuck yourself. In French, je suis français, I'm French, je viens de Paris, I come from Paris. And I run to the taxi, take me to downtown uh, Copenhagen. That's how I made it to Europe. Then I went, uh, once you're in Denmark, you can go to Finland, you can go to Norway, Sweden, and Finland. And uh, I did. And after this, I went to Germany. Then I went to Holland. I lived in Wallendam, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Adam. And after this, I used to travel a lot between Köln, Cologne, and Germany, and Amsterdam and Holland on a train. No passport, no paper. I don't know what the fuck I did. I made it. And then I used to put my luggage above a Hawaii to people. And I said, without luggage, they thought I was local. They thought they were from out of town or from a different country. Then I, I was high. Oh my God. Oh my God. I was high all my life at that time. I wish I wasn't. I would remember more about those 
thicky countries. So uh, then I made it, uh, I got another passport and I made it to Orlando, Florida somehow. And I was uh, fucking the fattest woman to get my green card for free. I never got that fucking free green card. Never got it. <laughs> Look, I know. It's not sad. All the hard work. That, that is a nothing. lot of hard work for a green card. One year. Got. One year. One year. She was so big. Oh my God. She was so big. Too much meat to eat, but she was so big. Oh my God. You had to shoot. Like she, she said, put your head there. You know, uh, eat me out. And I did. And uh, because of walking around and big fat legs, her legs were brown on both sides, right? Between her neck and inside the legs. Uh, uh, it was, she was using gravy browning instead of using the other. Oh, the suffering I went through. So, so then I lived in New Lake County, Eustace of Florida, the biggest redneck town in the world. Right. Like the biggest. Lake, the Lake biggest. County? Yeah, Eustace, Florida. Yeah, called Lake County, Eustace, right. Florida. Almost 40 minutes from Orlando. So, uh, no Spanish, no Asian, no black allowed in. It's cute Lebanese, just walked in. And I was in charge of a town within a week. A church bazaar, country fair. I just stick my nose in everything they did. You couldn't help believe it. They were shocked. You see, this little guy can decide for us about everything almost. I almost did. Then they love me. Then they call me the Arab. They never call me by my name, Sal or Salam or the Arab. Where's the Arab? Arab is not here. So if I didn't show up one day for any function, they can knock on my door to make sure I'm okay. So this yeah. is in this community and and you really became part. And now it's probably a big town, but in all days was very small. Very small town. All are born again Christian. We the smokers. Oh, mm -hmm. oh. Their girls fuck me like God doesn't exist. Oh my God, their car. Oh my God. And I, I don't know how to say no, huh? I did it all for free. One year of my life, I wasted it. Then I had a minor car accident and I had all the state insurance for my car. Always, I don't care. You have paper, no paper. They give you insurance for your car as long as you pay. You know, they don't give it a damn. At that time, I'm sure now it changed. Then uh, they uh, had a minor car accident. Then police came around my ID. What the hell ID? I have no ID. Then I say I have no ID. So what do you mean? It's, 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 you know, I'm, you know, illegal. And he said, now you have two cases to go. Car accident and no paper. Oh shit. So I ran away to Maine, from Maine to Vermont, from Vermont to Quebec. And I tried to get my paper organized and things. I had a hard time to do it. Then immigration officer, his name is John Saint Ange. Actually, he solicited me sex for paper. So I fucked him. When one of these, I got my paper. Obviously, I was cute. Well, you still are. So, so, there's a, a, a human rights lawyer in BC. Mm -hmm. She want to take federal government for to court. Because of this. Sex for paper. Right. But I don't know if I want to go for it because I'm a whore, right? It's like, a, I mean, I did more drugs than anybody else. I did more alcohol than anybody else. I mean, what could the fucking reputation I already have? <laughs> so are you sober you know, now or like, do you, do, you, do you still, do you smoke weed or anything like that? I don't like weed. It's legal. Who wants to smoke legal shit? Yeah, well. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is for boring people, man. Oh, I smoke weed. Oh, I smoke fat one. Oh, fat, fat. Well, I fucked a fat one for a whole year for nothing. <laughs> So, <laughs> you're not getting anything out of it no so so do you, so i do put up here and there like uh, when we have an uh, orgy or something if we right. are a night right and uh, yeah. then uh, everybody uses uh, cialis and viagra right mm -hmm. and not me weird. i do what's called uh, triple p you know what it is triple like three a P, like letter P, like Paul. So, triple P, you inject it in your dick. Too bad we're not on live on camera. I would just show you. I could do a demo for you. Because I did it in a deli many times for people, right? 
So it's like uh, if you do line, yeah, your penis turn into rubber band. Right. If you do a crystal mat, nothing can wake up your penis except triple P. Okay. Long. So you were in this uh, this drug fueled orgy. Um, I did E and C and K and G. I used to go with alphabet every night. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, That's so, why I'm so educated. But then, how did you finally become sober? What was sort of this this moment in your life when you're like, I, you know, sounds like this is not sustainable. Did you say sober? Yeah. I guess uh, you're a bit wrong here a little bit. But I'm controlling it, right? I'm controlling. I'm not like, oh my God, I need my shit. I need my, I need, right. the, I need that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, but if there's party, sex party, oh, fuck it, I'm going to get higher than anybody else. Right. Still to this day. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. Well, what, what's, your, uh, what's your drug of choice? Well, lots of them still. <laughs> <laughs> So you you actually do drink then? No, I don't like alcohol. No. I used to drink uh, until uh, almost age of 29. There's a restaurant called Papitas on Robson Street. I'm not sure if it still exists, Mexican food. And I was there with uh, two friends and we were, the restaurant was long. In the corner, there was a table like by the kitchen, the only available table. So I had like two pictures of margaritas and I got like, the fuck three, four beer. I already had at home vodka tonic. And I went to the restaurant and I said to, uh, I went to the restaurant and after like uh, drink out the, uh, this uh, margaritas and, and all the beer, I said to them, oh, I need a fucking fresh air. I have to stand up, stand up. What I did, I stood up. I couldn't, stood up, couldn't even stand up. Blah, I vomited in the middle of a restaurant. Back with people. We're not talking about like vomiting a little, vomiting like, the salsa, the nacho, the fuck. <laughs> oh my God. Explosive. I walked walk two step and I scream, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I apologize to people. One more. Oh, I'm sorry. I went on Robson Street. I hold to the uh, light pole, like pull, but I pull. And I hold it to it and by vomiting. And the pain was to my chest was so severe. The pain was so severe. So I decided uh, no alcohol for me. I, then I stopped. Actually, I had the phobia for alcohol for almost, for almost, uh, you know, I'll tell you honestly, when I went back to drugs, and after the death of my brother, when he was killed in Paris last year. Oh, what, ha what happened? My brother is a doctor. Now, if you go on my Facebook September last year, he's a doctor, um, Dr. Mahmoud Kahit. So if you go on, last year, I went to Lebanon, I picked up his body from Paris and for an Islamic burial in Lebanon. And my brother was uh, killed the most brutal way in Paris. I'm sorry to hear that. Can I go get a glass of water? Of course. And the French government doesn't give us any information about the pillar. So, so, uh, 
His nose was chopped, or his ear was chopped, his face was chopped. My father still said to me, come back here before the white people kill you like they killed your brother. Is that what happened? I don't know, we're just waiting to see that the French government is going to give us any news about my brother. This ha this happened a year ago? <clears throat> yes, if you got my Facebook page, you can see it. My father would say, come back, come back. He said, why do you want to come back to Lebanon? He said, because the white people are going to kill you like they kill your brother. Come back. Live with us. I tried to explain to him. I mean, Canada is different. I mean, I have good relationship with lots of people. Some people said he probably was killed because he helped uh, black people, people on a boat from Africa because he's a doctor. He has a, his uh, own organization to look after little kids from all over the world. Like, uh, uh, the, if you go on my Facebook, you can see some picture, him with his like equipment and uh, with like like first aid, whatever on his back, with other doctors jumping on a ship to uh, to to help a people coming from Africa. And so, uh, I would. Uh, Wait, it sounds like your okay. brother was a hero. <laughs> Much like you. He goes, to, he goes to Africa to Benin Republic, Republic de Benin, mm -hmm. every year for one month, the poorest of the poorest. He saved thousands of black lives, right? One fucking nigger in the U.S. got killed. Entire world jumped. My brother who saved a thousand lives of this negro Nobody even count. Nobody didn't even count. He has his own organization to look after little kids. They put these ursons, like little bears. They got up these ursons, these little bears. Actually, this video on September last year, you can see my brother brought a family from Morocco. They speak French. And, and he knowingly that their kid won't survive. He said, if I can extend his life by two more days, and let the parents enjoy having a kid for two more days. It's my duty to do it. He brought them to, to, to Paris. And then uh, at the end of the video, he said, it's like, la lit entre le pouvoir. It's like a war between a power and, uh, and, and people less power. I have to unplug this kid now. And he said, uh, but I want to make it the easiest way for him to die. Even though the baby is dying, my brother wants to make it easiest for him to die. I mean, this man gave all his life for poor people. Everything will be all right one day, in my mind. I think this is uh, the worst thing could happen to anybody, to see your brother chopped into pieces. So when I was told, I couldn't stop that uh, thinking uh, how much he suffered. Did he beg for his life saying, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. It's like, uh, It's been going on for you over a year now. No answers. Every day, I wanted to kill myself. Every day. You you want to kill yourself? Yeah, after killing off my brother a year ago. Every day I want to kill myself. I don't... Uh... Do, you, do you believe in, like, what do you think happens after we die? Honestly, what do you believe? I believe there's a second life. 
I believe the, the choice you have to make if you want a second life or not. Mm-hmm. And second life, you have to earn it. It's not going to give it to you like this. So I believe life is nothing but uh, it's a, uh, one second. Life is nothing but uh, purification for better life later on. Okay, so I believe that. I believe that strongly. If that's true, then I mean, what happened to your brother is horrific, and I'm so sorry. But if what you believe is true, then like fuck, man, he gave his life literally for other people, and. So have you. So you can't give up, right? That's not what your brother would want. It's hard to deal with it. Pardon me? It's very hard to deal with it. I, I, it's very I, hard. I, can't, I can't imagine. I mean, have you been able to deal with it? No. Have you had anybody to talk to? Yeah, I talked to lots of doctors. Right. But uh, I don't know. I think this is one reason I gave up on it daily too. Mm. At, at once I lost so much faith in everything. You see, 94 years old man, my father, grieving the death of his son chopped to pieces. I mean, what what these people did to your brother is like, it's horrible. It's hate, you know? It sounds like it's hate. Okay. Why, it's why it's else? I think it's political because he's Lebanese, Arab Muslim helping foreigners. I I, I don't know. I, I just I don't know either. But there's rumors, and the French government doesn't really say any information. Police don't really say any information. We had a lawyer cost like four thousand eight hundred euro, seven thousand dollar. Then he called me during uh, during uh, that uh, the black guy who got killed in the U.S. on the same week. He called. Oh, he wants more money. I said, What do you have for me? Oh, we cannot talk about it. Then fresh accent. I'm gonna talk about it. It's the investigation is still going on. I said you got four thousand eight hundred euro, mm-hmm. and now you want to ask me for more? Is it? Is it? Are you? I said I said to him in French, "What if for for Go stuff your ass." So mm-hmm. uh, yourself in good English. Uh, then uh, I was scared that my father's gonna get mad at me. Then I talked to him on the phone. He said to my father, "Hey father." Uh, uh, but nicely, I was thinking to my father, he's 90 something years old man. So I said, I want to break news to him that I fired a lawyer. So I was like, uh, but I, what if I did something wrong? My father didn't want to fire a lawyer. So I was right. like, well, how are you going to deal with it? So I said to my father, I was like, what do you think if, uh, if one member of his family killed him, if his friend killed him? Uh, uh, and my father said to me, so I'll put it this way. It's not going to bring him back to life mm. if we know who's the killer. So what's the waste of time and energy on it? He said, don't. He said, I said to him, I fired him. Good for you. My father's 94. He's on his cellular phone all the time, Googling. And all this, all his, he sits down like this. He's skinny. When you go on Facebook, if you have a chance, you get some picture of him. Oh, my God. He's like two-thirds of my height. It's skinny, it's skinny, it's skinny. Yeah. And then you get somebody like me, monster, next time. He's below my shoulder. The poor man. When was the they last? Huh? When was the last oh. time that you were with your your family? That day, I went to brought my brother to for burial. One guy came. His name is James, Polish. And to the deli, then I said to him, uh, hey, you don't look too good. 
I said to him, you don't look too good. You look your, because I always cheer up my customer regardless, because I don't think it's their fault what happened to me and my family. Right. So, because something like that happened to me. Like, you know what I was in Lebanon? My sister, she's religious. And she, she was crying loud. Why well, ask? Why ask? Look at you, how many thousand people you feed all your life for poor people. Him too. Africa every year. And she was killed four days before he left to Africa. Every year, one month, goes to Africa helping poor people. So my sister said, why, why ask? And I got angry at my sister. I said, who said someone else deserves it more than we do? Would you be happy if it happened to your neighbors? Right. My, uh, my sister, she hugged me and she, she apologized. Well, we're just trying to make, you're trying to make sense of this horrible thing that happened, right? That's where the anger comes from. You're just trying to make sense of something, I think. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I still think life is fair. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bullshit that happens. Because, because you got your color, race, sex, sexuality, all born the same way, all gonna die. Mm. And none of us knows anything about the future. Regardless what religion you are, regardless how handsome you are, what color you are, Life is fair. All come the same way. We're gonna die. Nobody knows anything for the future. This is my talking about life. I, I think that, you know, we're united in death. Like that's definitely something that we all get. That's equal for us all. But the way that, you know, we've created countries and governments and things like that, it has made it unfair for a lot of people. Yeah. So, and that's something that you've fought against, right? You know, you've, you take care of homeless people in Pigeon Park, you feed them and you've never asked for any, you know, uh, trophies for what you've done. And I don't want it either. Yeah, no, exactly. Neither did your brother. He did it because you guys have done this because it's what you believe in, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, a hell of a legacy. A good human being, it can feel the pain of others. Otherwise, yes. we're animals. Yeah. A human race is supposed to look after each other. 100%. A human race can um, build houses and bridges, freeways, hospitals. But let's talk about animals that live fucking in a cave. I'm like, in a fucking cave. <laughs> it doesn't make a human race a human race. Yeah. We care for each other, although it's not the same way like 100 years ago, where churches look after, I was government look after, like uh, hospitals. I mean, they look after me the best way you can imagine. I have to admit it. I mean, I have all service I want. They take care of me. Uh, I make them laugh a lot when I go there. And uh, last Wednesday, I was at St. Paul Hospital. And uh, we do exercise, but they put me on camera. They're gonna put on YouTube soon, I guess, to teach people with cardiac problem how to exercise. <laughs> yeah, because I'm energetic, right? I'm an energetic man. I you don't that. say, yeah. Huh? I said you don't I say, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like a challenge. So when yeah. I go there, so there's two more people came with us. Oh, they're so fucking lazy, complainer. Uh, like one of them, like 50 years old, I guess, for example. She was like, like 10 years old girl. I said, what? I didn't say anything because I'm very polite, right? But all the attention went toward me because I didn't go, I went to trade mill. I didn't go to the bicycle. I'm going, I increase it. I hike on one side, take a maximum 15 minutes. I couldn't walk for two days after that, right? It was like a show off for me. Then <laughs> the other message she said, do you want to do bicycle? You want to do that? Do you, want, you know, rolling like this? I said, I do rolling, man. I did it. Oh, for, for like 50 minutes non-stop. Then you have to do warm up and things like this. But it's going to be on YouTube soon. Uh, for uh, what, Because they're doing a program about uh, cardiac healthy, heart healthy, heart cardiac. Well, fuck it. I don't know what it is. I volunteer. Like I go there. Did, didn't, you ha didn't you have cancer or something like that a few years ago? I had a car accident. What's I that? Really I had a major car accident. 
I was rear-ended by a semi on freeway. Oh, man. 95 kilometers an hour, 140,000 pound load hit me. Holy. Then when I did, had... Uh, hmm? When did this happen? Uh, two, uh, July the 4th, 2011. Oh, 4th so of July. July. Listen to this carefully. Listen carefully. Uh, so I was hit by truck. And they took me to the hospital. They test me. Oh, is everything is okay, Mr. Cahill. You can go home. So next day I went to see my doctor. I collapsed on her floor in the office. So oh, you have to go to emergency now. So they sent me to UBC hospital because no waiting time. Mm -hmm. I went to UBC hospital and uh, other the cities kind of things. And they released me. They said all the bruises. So uh, day six, uh, 14, I went back to the hospital, UBC. Dr. Edmund treated me like shit and two nurses, British and East Indian. But the East Indian, she was ugly. She was like 400 pounds, like one in Florida. I, probably she never washed her hair. I swear to God, like ugly monster. Oh my God, how can a man to fucking touch her? I can't. Yeah. God forgive me for this. God forgive me for this. Oh. Her, me. Vagina, her vagina must be like a split liver. No joke. Oh, I don't know how people eat it. <laughs> I'm trying really hard not to envision that right now. No, yeah, you're right. Otherwise, you're going to turn gay. Uh, but you're cute. You can make money while being gay. Don't worry about it. I've, uh, I've been told that before. Right? So, <laughs> you make money. I made lots of money. I swear. I got $55,000 uh, loan from a school principal after I fucked him for two nights. <laughs> I got from uh, H uh, HS HSC bank manager. I fucked from one night. $21,000. Yeah. Uh, Bob Reno, realtor in Seattle. I fucked him one night. He paid my rent for a year and a half. So <laughs> check. <laughs> what were we talking about? We were talking about different subjects. We're, we're talking about how you were in the hospital and then you, you started telling me about these day wonderful 14, nurses. Day 14, I went. Dr. Edmonds refused to serve me, help me. He said, you've been here. Everything's okay. It's just the bruises. I said, all the blood under my skin. So uh, then they had that English, British lady and East Indian. Both of them had terrorist operation, I guess, in their homeland, right? And they got the Muslim guy in their hand. Mm -hmm. Revenge, right? So, so uh, they put that thing to measure my blood pressure. Actually, they wouldn't look at them, come to my room. Then, uh, then they, they say, okay, you go home. Then I'm lifted. I had to lift it myself. So I was talking to Dr. Edmund said, please help me, man. Like, I think I'm going to die. And Dr. Edmund said, no, nothing wrong with you. Go home. Day 16. Nobody lived more than 14 days after car accident with type A aorta dissection. My aorta was burst. Whoa. <laughs> Your heart. My, my aorta. That, oh. So, 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 day 16, I don't remember how I went to work. I did go to work. And all of a sudden, I was serving my friend, Craig T. Uh, he does the uh, Suri Eats uh, Facebook page. You have to talk to him. He tells the story. He was there. He was begging me to go to the hospital. No, man. I don't want to go to the hospital. So I jumped on the counter. Now I'm gone. I'm hallucinating, right? Apparently, paramedic came in to pick up a sandwich. People said to him, whatever happened to Mr. Kay, we think we have a heart, uh, cardiac arrest, whatever it is. Mm. So, I mean, from two hours at the deli, they didn't know that I was in aorta dissection. Aorta dissection. You know how dangerous it is? Nobody lived more than 14 days when it's damaged. 16 days. If you see my movie, Sandwich Nazis, they saw that the doctor who operated on me, Dr. Gunning, yeah. from Royal Columbia. Nobody ever lived 16 days except this guy. Well, you're, you're, uh, you're an anomaly. There's no question that you, my friend, are an anomaly. <laughs> In more ways than one. Then uh, took me to Surrey Hospital because I didn't find out what's wrong. Yeah. Surrey Hospital, one little Chinese doctor, five, he said, uh, he looked at, oh, he has an aorta dissection, I guess. CT scan, straight back ambulance, police escorted, Royal Columbia Hospital, straight to operation room, doctors waiting, nurses waiting, 12 and a half hour operation. Mm -hmm. there's there's one there's one thing i want to kind of ask you about and uh um i'm not i i, I apologize if it seems like i whatever you want don't be too polite don't be kind yeah of yeah okay okay but what, like the n-word you know what i mean i really it's a part of the negro my brother said ten thousand of them nobody yes yes i mean it's like it's like one Nigger got killed. Terrible. 
one who saved tens of thousands from a ship goes to Africa and Republic, yeah. right? It's like, why? Like, it's a part of the history. But, but Sal, the world, the rest of history. Sal, and lots of things. That people have. Right. But here, like, you know, here. John McDonald, yeah. a founder of Canada, founder yes. of Canada. Yeah, yeah. He put a bunch of Indian and now people are taking down his pet and sculpture and changing his name of his street mm -hmm. back to a different name. It's a part of the history. Except turn down this fucking sculpture or statue. Why don't you leave a note like something bronze? Say sure. the history. What he did wrong? Yeah. Keep the heritage going. Well, and, and, you and, and more about the Chinese heritage in Canada, the East Indian fucking heritage in Canada, than you worry about Canadian heritage. You know what's Canadians crazy? We have to apologize to every right. race in the world. We have to apologize to everybody in the world, except the Zacadien, French Canadian. Never apologize to them. Yeah, I, I, I can see that point. Uh, okay, so so he, hear me out here. What, when you're talking about, I assume you're talking about George Floyd, right? About this guy who was yeah. killed in the States. Yeah. There's, there's a lot, there's a history behind this. Like, there's no questioning that there's inequity, there's racial inequity in Canada and in the United States, all in the world. And we're trying to fix that, right? So, I mean, he was killed by police, right? Like, that's fucked up, man. Just like your brother's fucked up. But when we're like, these things are wrong. And we got to make it right. Because kindness and, and love, that's what we got to do. That's the key to racism. And racism is real, man. No, it's not. No? No, it's not. In my daily... No East Indian ever came back to pay a sandwich. I give them one credit. No <laughs> Filipino ever came back to pay it. White people come and pay it, all of them, and give me some extra. Right. You know what I mean? Now, culture involved. Yes. Trudeau said, when he was elected, said, we have to embrace the other cultures. Why? If it's better than mine, yes, I will. But should it be mine, I'm not going to do it. So they come to my store. Now, uh, we had a sign at the door said in old days, you had to remove it. Because it said, if you're hungry, you don't have the money, it's on a house. Filipino and East Indian, they all want a free sandwich. We have to remove the sign, we have to use our judgment. Is it racist? No, it's a fact of life. East Indian, don't come pay the sandwiches. With a turban, man of God goes to the temple, my ass. If you're a good temple, pray to God, pay you meet that fucking sandwich, then go to God and pray for God. Because of... this so, is true, this is a fact from my story. We don't give a credit to East Indian and Filipino. Am I racist? No, I'm protecting myself. Then they're gonna come pay me. They will never pay me. DHL employees weren't allowed in our daily for five years because one Filipino, his name is Jesse, work at the airport, he still work there, and I gave him a credit for two sandwiches because he was so ugly. When he laughed, his mouth was bigger than his face. I never saw something as ugly in my life. So he's ugly and crook on top of it. Why would any woman fuck him? It's like, you see me? So he came to Delhi about three sandwiches. Then he got a call from a supervisor for two more sandwiches. And he, is, and he said, oh, it's my territory here. I can't pay this afternoon. That day never came. I know his name is Jesse. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, any employee came from, uh, from BHL, oh, you put the sign at the door. You're not allowed in. And you get my money from just I never got it. I even got emails from the company in Frankfurt. But I still don't get my money. And they send the same thing. Once they come to my store, they don't pay. So am I racist? Oh. <laughs> oh uh, I'm waiting for the answer. I am I racist to say. This race, I'm not going to give them credit because then they're going to come and pay me back. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a, there's a problem when we look at a group as a whole, right? Like, all white people do X. Do you know what I mean? Well, all, when, our white, all our white people come pay me sandwich, give me extra too, I swear. Uh, you know what? I'll tell you this. A couple of days ago, I went to my store and there was a, a business card from a guy with uh, $20 for two sandwiches he bought, he said, three months ago. Mm. Throw it from the whole guy. He said, I came a few times, you're not there. So the hole above my door, there's windows open, there's the T-bars, he threw it there. And, and he, he, he sent me an email telling me, 
it's on a shelf. It fell on a shelf. So when you go to my first grab it. Right. I didn't mean that. It's like, then, uh, and, and, uh, but it's culture. If I, if I want to, if I want, but it's any culture, I swear, it has to be way better than mine. I'm telling you right now. Do you, do you think that there's a bit of a problem when we look at cultures as being inferior or superior to others? Do you think that that's a problem? Well, well people bring it on themselves. Like, uh, right. I'm black and I'm going to, I'm black if it's going to discriminate against me, if it's going to discriminate against you. Matter of attitude. East Indian, they all have small penises. Smallest penis in the world is not Chinese, it's East Indian. I've seen enough of it. <laughs> so it's, that's not a joke either. Well, one of my clients, he was like 6'4. I fucked him in the deli in the back for $50. His penis wasn't bigger than probably, I swear. Anyway. How, how so, is Food Safe never shut you down for some of this stuff? It's in the back area, man. That's all that's... <laughs> Well, it's, so, listen, uh, 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 okay, I'm Lebanese, Arab, Muslim. Mm -hmm. How come I don't have a problem? I mean, this is some, sometimes something happened, people make stupid comments. But if I have, I serve 600 people a week, one bad white man, I'm going to leave, all of white people are bad, I'm not going to let it happen. But if you have 99.9% .9 of white people pay their sandwiches, and 99% of Indians don't pay their sandwiches. We have a problem. It has nothing to do with white people and racism. It has to do with, with okay. It has to do with culture. Some culture, if you like to save your face, you make you smart. Compared to our culture, you have to be ethical. Right. Now, now you look at the restaurant, to interrupt you, McDonald's has started being bought by East Indian. You don't see white people or Chinese working in a Filipino or East Indian with their hair like a ponytail flying everywhere, right? They don't tie up the girls, right? And I don't eat at McDonald's, never. There's one on uh, Wellington Avenue in Grandview. All the East Indian, I'm pointing out their hair, long, like, 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 like almost like a horse, oh, fuck. and then flying everywhere. But all the touch shit, you know I mean, I'm not gonna go there. Right. Uh, it's good. Huh? I'm listening, yeah. So, so you can tell who's the new owner of a restaurant by the type of employee there. Now, the East Indian hire East Indian. Look at the security companies. How many white work for them? Every security company is around, they're all brown kids. Is there any white kids need a job to pay their school in September? No, obviously. If you have a white company that have visible minority in, will be sued, we think the human right. But the restaurant, the security company, how come they don't hire white kids? So are you saying that because these companies are owned by, say, East, East Indians, Indian. right? No. They'll only no. hire East Indians, is, is that what you're- Political party, political party in general, political party. It's yeah. a suck up for a visible minority and immigrant. It's a suck up. Now, as I have majority of Indian in a certain part of the town, the, the, uh, the MP runner has to be the minority, right? Why? You, like, you have to look at the East Indian and say, oh, what is East Indian? Because they're going to look at the community. How about the rest of us, you idiot? So would you say that it's pretty unbalanced then? Is, is, is that what you're saying? It's, 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 it's the worst democracy in the world is in Canada. Why, why is that? Why is that? Simple. You elect the man, you have a lobbyist run the government. Right. Now, a real democracy, a people run the economy. Yeah. If you have some lobbyist come to the government and say, oh, you should do this, and you should do that. Right. But don't, the government doesn't represent you. They represent the lobbyists that hired by a big company. As long as you register lobbyists, it's not a bribery anymore. Isn't that stupid? So, so because of these lobbyists, these, uh, for, for example, Doug McCallum, remember the Uber thing? Yeah. And he took Uber to court. Well, many people say, yeah, that's just lobbyism right there because the taxi cab companies didn't want yeah. that because they would lose a bunch of money. Is, is that sort of what you're saying? Only this is on a broader sort of scale? It's, it's, it's lobbyists and briberies of the same shit. Whoa. This been paid by that company to go convince the minister of something 
to get his ideas. Like, okay, give me something. A cheese uh, quota from Europe or all over the world. Yeah. When they did the free trade with Europe, they gave almost 60 or 70% of a quota to big multinational companies. But small people like me, they made it so difficult. Every three months, you have $10,000, like 10,000 kilo of cheese, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like $50,000 cheese. You have to sell it within three months. And if you don't sell it, you take a quota away from you. Now, not just this, I, uh, there's a suck up shit. And then after every three months, you have to hire an accountant couple thousand dollars you said the government reported that you sold all the cheese right so so difficult right right, right 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 you're talking about uh like the the milk banks or whatever and how they they have quotas on dairy yeah right so small people like us we cannot sustain it we can't really stand against big multinational companies you know 35 years ago when i started my business all of oil used to be deli item <laughs> really I'm serious. Yeah. Parmesan cheese was a deli item. It's like, it was a deli item. It was like pickles, deli item. You don't see that super soda and things like this. Right, now they right. Have, they're, they're now ethnical uh, section. So small hours, it's really, uh, I don't know how I survived that long, but I survived in the business for that long. 35 years. What, why do you think that you survived this long? Because I think I have the answer. <laughs> Constant struggle, okay? If you got Canadian Food Inspection Agency come to your place, yeah, to your warehouse, I'll never obey the rules, I have to admit. I mean, no I kidding. Do, 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 Evid uh, evidently so. Oh, fuck, I love this. <laughs> so it's like, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go to jail, I can't talk much about it. But it's like, oh my God. It's like, uh, I charmed them. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a charming person. I just charmed them. I was like, oh, <laughs> it's like, uh, I did you prop? Did you pro you propositioned yourself, didn't you? Oh fuck yeah! <laughs> you know what? The police officer around 15 years ago, I gave him a blow job. I was driving on a freeway, around 160 kilometers an hour and 100 kilometer zone. I thought the light. Oh, sir, you're fucked. But the police officer came by my window. He didn't put his head down the window. He still had that up, and his zipper was halfway down. So I give him. I was like this. <laughs> Under his balls. He didn't huh. move. Then he took me to uh, Kingston exit. Then we went around, turn right, and we went on the lake. And I gave him, I gave him a blow job and then saved $500. So better than nothing. Well, right? oh, you got to get out of it some way, right? When I did. Well, I think that the reason that you've been so successful uh, is because you're just a likable person. And you truly are yourself. You know what I mean? There is, if you look up the word authentic in the dictionary, you'd be an example. I try. I try to be, I try to be fair and good in life. Well, I really do my very best. I really do my very best. I'll really tell you, man, you, you, there was one day I was at the shop and I was feeling, you know, kind of down or whatever. I was like 21. And I left there thinking like, man, you're a good guy. So, and still to this day, you have that effect. I hear this every day. I hear this every day. Well, get used to it, man. You know, 10 years later, you're still the same that good human. I came in, he left a bottle of wine, he had a bottle of wine on the counter in a paper bag. And I finished his sandwich and I gave him a sandwich. I said, you buddy, $8.40. He said, this is $8.40. It's $20 for a last sandwich you gave me. I really don't remember. I give lots of free sandwiches. Yes. I really don't remember. He said, there's a bottle of wine for you, by the way, he said. I was I was having the worst day ever. I thought it was against mm -hmm. me. Nothing, nobody take good in the world. And here you go. You finish the sandwich, you said, this is on a house, sir. And uh, I resisted, but he said, this is my store and I decide, not you. So I was like, for me, it's like, oh my God. You know, on Facebook, uh, uh, for uh, I, I was shutting down my store, a, a lady came in and she said, here you're shutting down. I want to come and have a sandwich because you fed me for so many years on his hastening. I have a home, I have kids, I have a car. You can wow. see, you go see it. Yeah, I took a picture with her, heart touching. You see, why? 
now there is a, between, uh, I'm not gonna name it. In one letter of this family, I've been feeding forever. They don't have no money. And I never met them. People told me. Huh. So uh, those guys, I, they don't have money now to pay gas. So I had to send a volunteer to deliver to them. Right, right. To one of them, right? And one day he said to me, he sent me a, a messenger, Facebook, sell, thank you very much for putting food on our table. Then he had a bowl. My son was torn apart with small pieces to feed their babies. Hmm. Yes, I cried. I said, shit. Look at you. You came with nothing. And you just give and give and you don't care. It's like you put food on those people's table even for their little kid to tear apart the small pieces, the sandwiches, salami and bread and things to feed their babies. Well, one thing about you is that it seems the more you give, the more you get, right? You have over, you yeah. have more than enough. I, I'm, 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 I would say I'm not a rich man. I'm not actually below average, but you know what? Uh, you saw I cook pasta and tomato sauce. Yeah. I cook, I can go yesterday. I, I had, I started a new page, by the way, on Facebook called yeah. uh, Cooking with the Sandwich Nazi or something like this. I don't remember what they said, but I don't remember what it's called, but I think it's called Cooking. So I was wearing my uh, my the, uh, my underwear with my butt out, right? So I didn't show it on face. I don't. I I miss sex like cooking with no shirt, like nipples out, belly out, balls out, almost. So it's so cooking with a sandwich. That's I think. Then. And I already have like four hundred two hundred and twenty something people like already in overnight. So um, <laughs> you have a following, my friend. Last question for you, Sal. Um, yes, sir. How did you get this name, the Sandwich Nazi? Oh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. I really believe I was called Sandwich Nazi before uh, uh, Seinfeld. Really? Uh, oh, yeah, I think so. Uh, Alec Baldwin. The actor? He used to come to the store, Kingsman Boundary. No way. I'm very oh, fuck yeah. Oh, the actor. Because in old days, there was four studios only. Boundary by the freeway. Yeah. Under the freeway, right? That's it. There's no more studios. It wasn't like now. Yes. So, I like Baldwin. I don't know. Uh, my employer is going like this. Ah, 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 ah. You see what's going on? Ah! <laughs> I said, like, what is it? I really? I said, well, I like Baldwin. Yeah. What the fuck is he? He was telling me. And he starts laughing. He was start laughing. He said, you're like a Nazi. You have no service, they have good food. But you can maybe say, <laughs> <laughs> I remember this. Then the Janet Angoro, because FM, you weren't born. You remember, Jan how old are you? 31. Oh, you weren't born. Uh, Janet Angoro on Kiss FM, today I was on a show. After this, we had uh, 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 Larry and Willie on CFAX every day, almost. Then after this, I went to Bro Jake. And after this, everyone, then that company who owned all this radio station, I don't know what the name of it, some kind of uh, entertainment thing. And that guy, the, the, the owner, uh, the owner, big boss, I think he's a black guy. So, oh, Mr. K, let's do something together. So I may go back on radio shit. You never know. <laughs> well, I love your personality, man. Thank you, brother. You're a good human. And uh, thank you for your time, Sal. I love so, you. I love you too. Full time. Full time. <laughs> all time. So so the, the shop is still open. So Saturdays and, and Sundays. Saturdays and Sunday. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm bringing my family in. So yeah, bring your husband with you. I will. He can't <laughs> wait to meet you. 